everyone, welcome back to our Diverse Talk episode 2 with Chris Lemon from the UK, connecting the dots within industries with perspectives from around the globe. Now, Diverse, what does it stand for? Diving innovation, variety, expertise, reality, safety and entertainment. That's what Diverse Talks will bring to you today. Now, the, today's topic is on diving career how Chris had become a Netflix star, a little bit about the incident that happened to him, how the incident had changed his outlook on life, work and others in the safety in the diving industry, his personal thoughts on where our industry will be in the next five to 10 years and what's next for Chris. Well, here with me today is my co-host Darren Brenton and myself, Nurul, presenting the special edition of the Diverse Talk where we have Chris Lemons, who is our special guest today in this Diverse Talk se session that we will be discussing with him on his views on the commercial diving industries, his experience working and producing the Netflix movie Last Breath and the aspects that brought around the movie. We will also be taking steps into the future with regards to commercial diving and Chris Lemons. Over to you, Darren. Thank you, Neil, and welcome, Chris. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to our YouTube channel and watching this interview. Um, Diverse Talks has been established for enable and engage with interesting personalities in the commercial diving industry, in the safety industry, in the entertainment industry, in fact, all industries. There's many people out there with a voice, and necessarily their voices don't always get heard. Um, they have excellent views and a lot of positive ideas and with challenging, they're always challenging themselves and we can challenge ourselves as well. We'll bring new dimension by gauging with individuals who have or are making the difference and with extraordinary lives with that and often in the commercial diving scene. Our first diverse talk with a, was with a guy called Michael Musel who lives in Thailand He's a saturation diver, but he's also a GP pundit, Moto GP pundit. And he's also a Malaysian Moto Championship as well, or champion. Um, so with that, we're going to be looking forward to talking to Chris, finding out more about Chris today. And his, as Neil just mentioned, his views on the industry, his views of what happened, how it changed his life, and what's the future for him as well. So welcome, Chris. Um, and if you'd like to introduce yourself, please, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Darren. Good afternoon, Nurul. Uh, thanks very much indeed for having me along. Um, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to talk to you and indeed to anybody who wants to champion diversity and the culture of safety in our industry. So, um, uh, yeah, thanks very much for, for having me. Um, as, as Darren mentioned, my name's uh, Chris Lemons. I, I'm also a saturation diver. I'm, I'm certainly not a MotoGP rider, but um, I'm, a, I'm a saturation diver and I work principally in the, in the North Sea. Um, I've been doing that most of my adult, adult life, really, um, in one form or another. Um, yeah, and uh, as Neural mentioned, I'm sort of involved in a, a fairly infamous incident uh, a few years ago, which uh, subsequently was made into uh, a Netflix film. I, I, um, you refer to me as a Netflix star there. I'm definitely not a star. I'm just a damsel in distress, really. But um, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about that and, um, and how that sort of affected my life and how it's affected us at, at work and, and, our, and our safety culture ever since, really. Yeah. Good. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, I would like to start this diverse talk session with you, Chris, asking you what exactly brought you into the commercial diving industry and what drove you to become a commercial diver? And how did you end up being a saturation diver? Yeah, um, I wish I had a more romantic story for this. Um, I've got colleagues who were sort of passionate scuba divers and followed their dreams into, into diving and so on. Um, my story isn't, isn't really like that. Um, equally, there are sort of people who've had uh, thrilling military careers and they've, they've gone on to continue that into, into uh, the sort of world. But mine was very much a being a young, really didn't really have any particular direction in life um, when I was in my sort of very early 20s. Um, and uh, yeah, a colleague, uh, sort of, sort of friend's father, uh, got me a job just working on the back deck of a, of a dive support vessel in the North Sea. Just, a, just a summer job, really, to get a bit of cash in when I figured out what I was going to do with my life. Um, and that sort of exposed me to this world that I knew almost nothing about. This, this, this world of commercial diving, and I got to see 
um, the saturation divers firsthand, or at least through the walls of a tank and on the screens. And um, yeah, that, that was sort of inspired me from there, really. I mean, uh, they probably drove up in slightly shinier cars than I did as well, which uh, was, was an influence, I won't lie to you. Um, but yeah, I think it was, it seemed very exciting. It seemed glamorous at the time. I've, I've learned, uh, I've learned better since, but it, at the time it seemed, it seemed like something I really wanted to do. And um, uh, yeah, so I, I just sort of followed on from there really. I, I worked on the, the deck of a, a, a various dive support vessels for a few years. And then I, that sort of allowed me to see everything firsthand. And then I went off and did my air diver training. Uh, and I worked as an air diver in the, principally in the North Sea, but all around the world really at, at different points. Um, for about um, about eight years, I did that, and then in um, yeah, subsequently in 2010, I took my my saturation diving course down in Marseille in France, um, and that's what I've been I've been doing ever since really. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's um, not a classic sort of entrance to the the field, but um, a practical one if you like. Yeah. So wow, that's been more than a decade, and from that, the career path itself has now led you to be a Netflix star. Can you let us know a little bit about the incident that brought you to that led you to that? Yeah, it's uh, it's a strange to be called a Netflix star, really. Yeah, to have uh, <laughs> sort of been a, it's been a strange thing, really. But yeah, it was um, it all stemmed from an incident which uh, occurred in 2012. It was September of 2012 when the um, the boat I was working on at the time it was called the uh, the Bibi Topaz at the time um, essentially suffered a catastrophic failure of its dynamic positioning system whilst I was in the water. I was in the water alongside my colleague Dave Uassa and we were working within a within a manifold on the on the seabed of the North Sea at about uh, I think we we're about 91 meters down that day um, and um, it was 10 o'clock at night there was about a 35 knot wind um, six or seven meter sea so it was fairly rough um, uh, still diveable just about but only just and um, because they had this complete failure and they lost all control of the of the ship above the every screen on the bridge went black basically uh, and they became a sailboat and started drifting away uh, with the wind and the, and the tide and the waves um, and we on the bottom tried to sort of uh, extricate ourselves from the manifold we were in and unfortunately whilst doing that my uh, my umbilical caught on a um, there's actually a transponder bucket which is a a bucket which they uh, they used to, to to put a transponder into position the manifold when they first install it so it shouldn't really have been there to be honest but that wasn't really a factor uh, my umbilical caught on that extremely quickly and, and became immovable very fast and uh, I effectively became the anchor on the end of a 5,000 ton ship um, and there's only ever going to be one winner in that situation um, so uh, you know to cut a long story short really my umbilical stretched to the point of, of no return and, and broke which left me on the seabed with uh, just my my bailout bottles. We were carrying emerg an emergency supply of gas on our backs, um, but at that depth, um, it's difficult to say exactly, but it would probably be only last maybe seven or eight eight minutes. And ultimately, it took the the ship nearly 40, 45 minutes to regain control, um, return to my position, and allow them to come back and get me. So um, I had this the strange experience of. Um, of basically counting down the minutes and the seconds on the bottom till I till I ran out of gas and um, knowing that that was going to happen. Um, uh, yeah, and then I passed into unconsciousness in very sad circumstances, as you, as you can imagine, a pretty lonely place to 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 feel like you were going to die because that's certainly what it felt like at the time. Um, uh, and then subsequently, it was extremely fortunate that uh, my colleagues came down to to rescue me, sort of some forty minutes later, um, pulled me back into the diving bell, uh, gave me a couple of um, rescue breaths and I came around straight away and um yeah and, and I would say miraculously survived I mean the, the survival is part of the miracle but the second part is that I survived without any any damage or you know brain damage if you like from ox oxygen deprivation at least no one's ever been brave enough to tell me otherwise so yeah that, that's the sort of the root of the story really and um uh it was picked up we made a, an in-house um documentary uh, with with the company at the time which we sort of took out to the to their clients um, they were they sort of championed the the safety side and the uh, you know they, they were they didn't try and hide any of that incident they, they put it right out there in the public forum so that everybody everybody could learn from that and um, it was uh, then picked up by the BBC in, in the UK uh, along with Netflix and they sort of co-funded uh, this sort of, sort of longer longer version of the documentary which has, has been quite a success and I think tells the story quite well yeah so there we go. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you for that, Chris. 
Thanks so much, Chris. I, I've watched the movie. Uh, I've obviously shared your story in, in our workplace as well. Um, and commercial diving and, and diving and safety is obviously a passion for me. Um, during my career, I was, uh, again, almost killed a few times. And if the emergency response and the uh, response of the team as well hadn't been the same, I, I probably wouldn't be sat here as well. So that led me to change my career and what I wanted to do, change my redirection of what I needed to do to give back, if you like, to the industry and, and what I wanted to do personally. So reflection on what the incident you had uh, and you were very close to you know, not making it at all. And, and thanks for sharing that with us. It must be really tough. Um, what drives you now for your career path? Um, is there anything particular? Is there anything you want to do now in your career path? Uh, and how do you want to try and make that difference? Or how do you see our industry changing on the back of what your incident happened? Yeah, I mean, the, the irony of, of our incident in some respects is that it was a success, success story um, in terms of the safety culture. You mentioned, uh, you know, you've had incidents where the people around you and um, the, the sort of procedures, if you like, have, have been your saviour. And that was very much the case for me. Um, I was very fortunate to have wonderful people not only in the water with me but on the ship above uh, you know a crew of 110 obviously to put put two of us on the bottom and uh, that night everything really ran like clockwork in terms of the incident response and the, the procedures and the and the, and the training and so on so we, we definitely learned things that night uh, we learned very small practical things um, um, which you learn from doing a drill in real time, you know, in a real situation. Um, silly little things like uh, Duncan was in the bell and he, he was unable to reach a, a knife to cut off my equipment or uh, grab handles in certain places to, uh, to assist Dave in pulling me back into the bell. And, uh, uh, you know, we've added lights to our umbilicals. We've... Um, We've now changed the uh, the bailout we use at uh, at uh, depth now into a, to a rebreather to give us potentially give us longer in that sort of situation. So we've learned lots of little practical lessons, but um, you know it was really a case of um, it, it being a success story uh, and a demonstration of how the repetition of drills and having clear procedures, clear lines of of uh, communications, hierarchy of command are very, very important. And we're very lucky in the North Sea in having that, that, um, that in place, you know, as, as I'm generalizing and I'm not suggesting we're complacent, but you know, we, we, we're lucky that we, we, we something that is at the forefront of everybody's mind. So in terms of, you know, something you talk about giving back and that's certainly something I feel I, I need to do. I, I certainly owe. And, um, whilst I'm, you know, I'm far from being an expert, on diving i'm still you know still in the course of my career if you like um, and i still see that as having some way to run in terms of um I've, in fact i've just done my my supervisor courses at kba uh, in singapore there which was excellent by the way and um you know i, I like to sort of see, see that side of things for a few years but yeah move on and uh, and possibly involved in in sort of safety related um work in the future uh, it's something i've tried to champion ever since i take every opportunity i can to to talk about it um the, the one thing i do have is is a, is a bit of a profile i suppose if you like now and people are interested in the story whilst as i mentioned i you know i don't consider myself any anything special in any way i very much just lay there and passed out and so that was about my role in things and uh but what it has is given you, you know, an, an opportunity. People want to talk to you, so I try to use that opportunity as much as I can to um, to talk about uh, not just diving safety, but safety culture in uh, in all industries because it pervades every every industry. So, yeah, I, I mean, I really think, you know, when you talk about diving in the next five years, you know, when I talk about the standards in the North Sea, I think those are sort of standards that we need to see created more uniformly around the world you know there are obviously lots of places that do it very well as well but there are lots of places that do it very badly as, as you well know Darren I'm sure um, uh, and I think that's something that everybody knows needs to be worked on uh, there are places in the world where there are divers working in in conditions and with safety standards that I don't deem acceptable um, and I think any opportunity we have to to, to highlight that and to do something about that then that, that should be taken so if I can play a small part in that over the next few years then you know, I think it'd be time well spent. I think that's that's a fantastic answer, and thank you for that. I mean, the when, when something when you're in a, a situation of you've almost been killed or something's almost happened to you, when all sorts of things are passed through your your 
eyes, if you like, in your mind in that situation. And then you come out of it and you, you then feel, well, why did it come out of this? I need to then share this. And that's what I see you doing. In fact, that's what your company did as well and, and really well for the industry. Um, but personally, uh, you're, you're also leaning into, you say you go around and talk and share. I think the message you have also can be shared into other industry sectors because emergency drill practice and practicing for the emergency is so important, not just in our industry, but in many industries. Um, uh, and then where it's led you to become that Netflix uh, star, as Neural put it, um, <laughs> You know, it opens the doors for you in, in other areas. So I know you you do some professional speaking. Is that something you want to get into to share your story more as well? Yeah, it's an opportunity which has arisen, really. It's been great and uh, definitely something I'd like to do more of. Um, it sort of began really with, um, in before the Netflix film, we, 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 we would take the, uh, or we'd be invited to take uh, the, the original documentary out and speak mostly to oil companies, um, to people within the industry. Um, but yeah, since the sort of the Netflix films come out, I've, I've had the opportunity to to go and speak at the Royal Medical Society, for example, down in London. And then I get a, I've started to be invited to sort of leadership conferences and management things out in Australia, in Canada, that kind of thing. So it's been a real privilege to do that. And as you say, it's a story which basically by telling a story, it gives me a platform to talk about um, yeah, safety, culture and procedure and uh, you know, and all sorts of subjects, really. We're talking a lot about uh, doing a lot on uh, mental health, for example, at the moment. Um, you know, we, like you, are in, in lockdown at the moment in the UK. So uh, we are, um, you know, we're, we're talking about, I sort of reference the the living conditions we have in terms of isolation and things like that and how that compares to, to lockdown and uh, mental health being, you know, a very hot topic at the moment. And uh, yeah, and um, yeah, so it stretches into business and that kind of thing. And as you say, we talk about, procedure and drills uh, you know um what we've learned another thing we learned was you know, you know the importance of the realism of drills in what we do in that uh, you don't just go through the motions when you're doing your your diver rescues or any kind of drill that you do those for real because it's only by doing them properly will you learn what it's actually like when it happens and the little the little details that i mentioned to you early on that, that would help you when the, when the time really comes so yeah it's been it's been a great thing and um uh, it's something I really enjoy first and foremost. Um, um, so yeah, I'd, I'd certainly like to do more of it. And, and now you've done your supervisor's course, you're obviously going into your leadership, you're, you're you know, being in that speaking position and sharing the stories, the leadership values come out really heavily. Um, I know you're gonna be a fantastic advocate for that. Um, have you written a book yet, Chris? <laughs> uh, it's actually in the process yeah <laughs> it's in the in, in the in the uh, in the pipeline yeah definitely uh, hopefully in the next sort of few months that'll be on its way out so Fantastic. yeah i mean right I'm, so I'm doing, doing the supervising thing as, as you say is important you know if that feels like a responsibility it's such a you know i feel it's the most pressured and responsible job on the boat so uh you know i hope to be able to do that well and to bring the um yeah the, the experience i have um to bear on that hopefully yeah Thank you very much. And I really look forward to getting a copy of that book. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Over to you, Nina. Well, thank you, Chris. That has been really, really interesting, you know, especially for lay men, lay ladies like myself. Um, you've, you've given us some insights to what a commercial diver in the North Sea um, are exposed to and what are the challenges and the hazards that you have in the workplace. Um, that has been very interesting and you are special, you know, because not just for your stories, but the very fact that we are talking to a man who just came back from the dead, literally, right? <laughs> so, hey, you know, how often do you get to do that, right? So, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And as a Netflix star, and I'm sure like Darren has mentioned before, um, you know, you will be looking at your public speaking career. So, what, what's next after your book, for example? What do you intend to foresee for yourself? Well, I, I, I still would like to be at the heart of it for a little while, um, at the coal face, if you like. I feel I still have a lot to learn. So, um, yeah, as Darren mentioned, I've, you know, I've done my supervising courses now at, at KBA there. So um, I'm hoping to do that for a few years at least. I think there's a lot to be to be learned in that role that I, I don't know already. So uh, I don't pretend to be an expert, and I think you need to you need to walk the walk before you talk the talk to some extent. So uh, I'd like to do that. But, yeah, I, I see myself after that hopefully um, being involved in uh, – yeah, the safety side of diving and certainly champion it, um, you know, um, right to the end of my career, I hope. So, yeah, we shall see. That's fantastic. I, I just got one more question, actually. So you, you went to this near uh, death, if we like to use that word, um, 
position and, and came back from that. So how did that change your total outlook, not just on your work, but on your life? Can you share something with us with that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, a good, it's actually the question I get probably asked the most often is, uh, did you have an epiphany of sorts? Um, it certainly felt miraculous at the time. But uh, strangely for us, I think I, I, my answer to that is really is no, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't actually changed my, certainly my personal life or my day to day life, it hasn't changed. Um, we had the, the euphoria, if you like, of getting through that incident. And I say we, those of us in the water and, and indeed all those involved. Um, and the sort of, uh, but strangely, the, the three of us in the water, I think, have sort of come through it the best purely because we had the euphoria of getting through it. Um, you know, the days of uh, you would sit in the bell wondering, could you ever rescue somebody, you know, in reality, um, you know, strangely behind us because we've, we've sort of been there and done that. So it's given us um, professionally uh, um, a bit more confidence, I think. Um, you come to realise how important the team is around you and how good they really are. They were, you know, so incredibly calm on the night. So that, that sort of has borne confidence in what we do, strangely. It was such a single point failure of an incident, you know, it was such a completely unusual and unlikely event that um, I don't really consider the possibility of that happening again, if you like. Um, so yeah, it's been a positive thing, but yeah, in terms of day to day life, uh, life, I found that life just goes on really, you know, you still have to put the bin out on a Tuesday and uh, you know, make a cup of tea in the morning, nothing really changes. Um, I, I think the only thing I would say is I perhaps have a slightly more acute awareness of death. And um, I think we all have a bit of that within us, don't we? We all think about, about dying, um, uh, you know, that inevitability, which is, which is coming away uh, just a matter of when, I guess. So, you know, I, you could say I've had a slight insight into what that might be like. Um, and I definitely have more, you know, an appreciation of life, but I, I'd like to think I had that before it happened. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just um, one more point. Obviously, the environment we're in today is very much into isolation, stay at home notice, stay at home. And obviously, being saturation divers, we're used to that isolation and um, living in a very small, confined area, the same people. Are there any tips, if you like, you could share with everybody? Uh, um, how to stay sane yeah. Party. Yeah. within that same group of people in that same area yeah well no that's a good point yeah i mean as well if you've obviously you've obviously experienced it as well so you uh, you probably sense the familiarity of uh, being uh, locked in your house there all day uh, i'm not quite sure what stage you're at in terms of, in singapore at the moment but um yeah it's um yeah that feeling of confinement um that being locked up with other people well that's that's one of the things at work is probably the most difficult the diving as you know darren is probably the relief uh, it's the having to live in close quarters with other human beings that you don't necessarily want to live in close quarters with um and all the standard pressures in that, that go with life uh, uh tend to be exacerbated i find when you're in saturation you know um relationship issues, uh, practical issues with a bank or anything like that, it became very difficult to deal with when you're locked in in that environment. So, yeah, I mean, in terms of advice, we've uh, I've certainly found, um, as I'm sure you did, that you, you sort of create coping mechanisms, even unconsciously or subconsciously. Um, I find I, I have to make sure I normalize my routine at work. I, um, I uh, make sure that I, you know, I, I have a routine at work, first and foremost, you know, I get up in the morning and have a cup of tea and I go and speak to people. Um, I, I know some divers who will go and do their diving, they'll come back into the chamber and they will just get in their bunk and close the curtain and you won't see them again. And for me, that's not normalcy. That's, that's sort of putting yourself in a, in a, in a bad place. Um, things like maintaining a positive frame of mind, which is a very easy thing to say, but uh, it's quite a hard thing to actually do. It's not just a case of putting a smile on your face, is it? Having a positive frame of mind. It's more about, um, I find, you know, just as a silly example, I'll never, I never count the days when I go in. I never say, oh, I've done one day, two days, three days, because we have to do 28 days in there. And that can be quite, an, that can be quite psychologically quite difficult. So I sort of almost forbid myself from doing that. Um, using it as an opportunity is always a good bit of advice. I think I'm sure we've all got the tidiest gardens we've ever had, but it's, um, I find going into saturation, uh, I like to say, well, this is an opportunity to have time. Um, I have two small children. First of all, it's an opportunity to sleep more than anything. Um, but it's also it's an opportunity to read books, to to learn a new skill, uh, and yeah, lockdown has, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and lockdown uh, lockdown has parallels, doesn't it? You know, it's a you say you have to sort of say, well, it's just, you know, it's a great opportunity to spend time with your loved ones, perhaps, or to if you don't have them, to to learn something, to yeah, do the garden, as I say. Um, yeah, and then I say finally, uh, they're probably making use of people around you. I find uh, at work. 
you it can be a bit intimidating at work sometimes when you when you when you're sort of a young diver that these sort of hardened divers or hardened old boys around you who seem intimidating but what you quickly realize over time is that um uh, they're in exactly the same boat as you they're suffering in the same way that you are they they don't like it any more than you are once you get beneath the surface they're not as tough as they look and none of us are um so you i find just speaking to them and uh, confiding in them um is very cathartic and that's the same same thing in lockdown you know speaking to family i'm i'm sure some of us have done more zoom talks with our family and i've spoken more to my brother and sister than I had in the previous 10 years, I think, in the, in the last few months. So um, that's been good, you know, and to share a shared, a shared experience becomes an easier one, I, I think. Yeah. So there, there's more, but there's yeah, plenty of parallels, as you mentioned, Darren, definitely. So that, that's fantastic. And just to summarize that up, I'd like to say routine, where you must get into a routine of doing things and keep that routine going. Opportunity, where you take the opportunity to study, learn new things and sharing, keep sharing with the people around you, keep the talk going, keep the discussions going. And, and I know when we're in saturation, like you mentioned, sometimes you're in there with people you don't actually want to be in there with or be near, but we're there. And sometimes when we're in isolation in the current climate, we are in the isolation with our loved ones, but maybe those upsets happen, but you've got to get over it and move forward. And it's very much like being in saturation. Not that we love each other in saturation, but we do have disputes and arguments and we move on. So there's some real good, powerful takeaways there, Chris. Thank you. My pleasure. That's very well put there. Very well summarized. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for spending your morning with us here with, uh, in Diverse Talk. We wish you every success for your future and we know you will succeed with your resilience and tenacity that you have for life now. Um, I would like to ask if Chris or Darren have anything else you'd like to say before we wrap this session up? Chris, over to you first. Yeah, well, thank you very much indeed. You know, yeah, I, I return that uh, completely. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much for taking the time. And um, yeah, good luck with everything for you too. I'm sure you'll be a great success with your, with your diverse talks and everything else that the pair of you do. So uh, yeah, thanks very much for having me. No worries. It's, it's been our pleasure. And I just want to thank you for, again, for spending your time. Maybe we'll ask you back in a couple of weeks or months time, to follow up to see how you're getting on with your career now. Um, but in the meantime, I would like to encourage everybody to join and um, log on and follow us on our YouTube channel, subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's going to be many more talks like this with very uh, individual that have not necessarily got their voice fully heard yet, but they've got a really powerful story to share. And there's so many takeaways as we've had takeaways from this uh, short session here with Chris. Uh, absolute gold. Thank you very much, Chris. So for those of you who have yet to watch the Netflix The Last Breath, go to Netflix, search The Last Breath and catch that film very soon while it is still on Netflix. Um, so don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.